Okay, so very good evening and warm welcome to yet another live uh, class on Einstein's general theory of relativity. And uh, my name is Shonak and very welcome to this special channel, General Relativity Explained. Well, when we left the uh, yesterday's class, that is, uh, we talked about, okay, let me put forward this slide. I think that would be much better so that we can recall. So here you see, we actually uh, started with this part that uh, how are we calling the space and time, which is intervened into something which is called a space time. Uh, so how do we do that? We found that the laws of physics are the same. So space and time must be intervened the geometrical description of gravity, and so on. Now, as you see that uh, I have shown yesterday only that uh, the Maxwell's equations were originally 20 equations, which was reduced to four equations, and it was the contribution of L Oliver Heaviside. The most important part lies in here. Now, you see, uh, I mean to say, first we need to understand that Maxwell's equation, which you can see right now on the screen, which tells that they are fully relativistic, which means that which follows from the fact that they are covariant under Lorentz transformation and they preserve the speed of light. Maxwell's equations are, however, only compatible with special relativity and not with Galilean relativity. Now, uh, this uh, statement itself has got a little bit of deeper understanding in terms of probing our mind and finding out the details of uh, what we call special theory of relativity. So as you see that uh, uh, first thing uh, I would like to present is basically an intuitive explanation as to why Maxwell's equations are relativistic. Definitely we will go into the mathematics to understand. However, we first need to discuss what is called a Lorentz transformation. Now, this part of the uh, you know statement i would say is pretty important as you can see that fundamentally we say that relativity has its roots in the following two statements first one the laws of the universe should look same to all the observers and second all observers should agree on the speed of light which is the invariant speed of light now the question is that if we do have an equation that preserves these two things. I mean to say the laws of the universe would be the same and the constancy of the speed of light. Then we can get something which is called a relativistic equation. Uh, why we are pro probing into relativistic equations? Because the concept of invariance, which will start from special theory of relativity, will take a drastic geometrical shape in the general theory of relativity. Again, I repeat, because this channel is meant only to teach you general relativity, no other topics of physics, or mathematics, or science. So I would be doing a little bit more into special relativity. The reason is that this invariance, this concept of special relativity would be generalized into much more complex and geometrical understanding of the invariance laws in terms of general theory of relativity. So here you see that these are the two things. And if we do have an equation, then it would, uh, uh, I would say, it would it would uh, perfectly match. So first thing that we need to ag agree is that what is basically called an observer. That means an observer, OK, let me put my jam board. So uh, that would be pretty easier to quick draw quick sketches and make you understand. OK, so. Right. So what we see there is basically we need to understand what is the overall idea of an observer. So uh, first we agree what is an observer. An observer is one whose frame of reference is inertial and is not accelerating. This is the basic thing we need to understand. Whose frame of reference is inertial and not accelerating. That means an observer in an inertial frame is therefore moving at a very constant velocity. So the curve would be same, constant. It would be moving at what is called a constant velocity. Now, these inertial frames, these, uh, I mean to say, what we are talking about, the inertial frames of reference actually have the property that they obey Newton's first law. What is that? An object in motion continues to be in motion unless acted or impulsed upon by an extra force. 
This must hold since we are introducing, I would say we are not introducing any external concept of force or accelerators in the observes, observer's frame. That means, say for example, let me take a quick sketch. Say for example, if I am here, I'm going to say if I take a, any kind of a frame of reference and here is an observer O, that means what I can say that it is moving up absolutely with a constant velocity. This is number one, which we call as an observer. And also what is important is that no, no uh, extra force is acting on it. First is that it is moving at a constant velocity. Second is that there is no, uh, I'm so sorry, I need to share my Jamboard, which I will just do it right now. Uh, present share screen. This is my Jamboard, right? There you go. So it is at a constant velocity and it is moving with no extra force, which is acting on it. So these inertial frame of reference have this property. So I can write it over here that it obeys, obeys Newton's first law. So this is also important. I'm so sorry. So it obeys Newton's first law. So this is what we define it as an observer in a specific sense. It's moving at a constant velocity. It has got no extra force and it obeys the Newton's first law. Now, a reference frame, if you talk, what is a reference frame? It is just a description of an observer's state of motion. And it describes basically how the observer would measure time and space. So we typically describe this by assigning a coordinate system which we can call as this one. Okay, so this is moving at a sp uh, speed and this is called the a frame of reference. And uh, let me explain it to you. So what is happening over here is that, as you can see right on this board, that uh, we have two inertial frames of reference. This one is actually the observer at stationary. So we can call this as stationary, this part. This one is stationary. And let me just make it a little bit bigger. So it is basically stationary and this is moving. And this is moving. So this is stationary and this is moving. I hope this part is quite clear to you. Now you see that so one for a stationary observer, which is the space and time, which you can see over here, this is T and this is X. Let me take the pointer quickly. This one, this one is T and this one is X. Okay, I will just take uh, this one. Yeah. yeah. So this one is T and this one is X. This one is X. So, uh, and uh, another observer, which is this one, this part, which is moving at a velocity of v. Here you can see, I think this is not visible. Maybe, yeah. So this is moving at a velocity of v dv. It has got something which is called a t prime and it has got something which is called an x prime. It's got a t prime, t prime and it has got an x prime. So the most important thing for us to understand is that how the reference frames of different observers are basically compared. I mean, say we essentially compare reference frames by doing a transformations, how the reference frame of the observers are compared. So what I can do is that I can put over a text over here. Let me see if it does really. Yeah. So how the different frames of reference are compared, different observer compared. So without this comparison, it becomes extremely uh, difficult. And most importantly, we also need to understand that we essentially compare by doing our transformation. So here it is. I would also like to put it over here. How do we do that? We do it by doing our transformation. We're doing our transformation. Right here. 
So we do it by doing a transformation. So one observer's frame of reference moving to another, how do we do? We do it by doing a kind of a transformation. Now, this transformation actually we can take place by anything. I mean to say it can be translation, rotation, and most importantly, what is called is a boost. Now, when we call, talk of the term boost, actually boost, uh, sorry, boost has got a lot of uh, significance. It can be Lorentz boost, which can be, you know, rotation, it can be speeding up things, but I will come to the boost part later. But what is important to understand the concept of boost, that means it is causing a coordinate change. And most importantly, what is also important is that we will understand the difference between Lorentz boost and Galilean boost. Yes, uh, we also have something which is called a Galilean boost, which I will be definitely talking. Okay, now I will move to my next part. Here you see, uh, not this one, I'm so sorry. Yeah, this part. So here you see, this is actually to, to make you visualize translation. Okay, let us move this part of the figure around, uh, say about here. I will just keep it over here. I will talk of this part first. So here you see, this is to visualize a translation. So you can imagine, uh, can you see the jamboard? Yeah. So you can imagine two people uh, who are standing with a kind of a long ruler on the same place. If one person moves along the ruler, it has undergone a translation. So in this figure, let me make it a little bit bigger for you. So what is happening is that we see that the object is undergoing a translation. This simply has this kind of, a, I would say, shifting effect in terms of spatial coordinates by some constant. So here is the shifting uh, place. So this one, this x has gone to this one, x prime. This one was the X, as you can see over here. This one, this has moved a little bit more here. And it has become X prime. So I would remove this uh, because uh, sometimes it becomes, oh, I'm sorry. Sometimes it becomes a kind of a problem. So where is the eraser? I'm so sorry again. So this X has, you know, generated a kind of, a, this is actually in terms we can call it as a boost. So it is not that boost is a secret of my energy, but it has given a kind of a boost and this X has moved to x prime. Now, in order to visualize this kind of a movement along, it is also important to visualize a kind of a rotation. Now, in case of a rotation, what happens, the axis bends, etc. happens. So it becomes a little bit cumbersome to, uh, you know, visualize the rotation. So what happens for the, uh, uh, you know, two observers related by rotation, which is from the center and the distance from the center does not change. But you will see that the angles are changing. That is the beauty. So I will show you the rotation in this part. Uh, no, 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 not this one. I have moved it somewhere else. Yeah, here it is. So the rotation. So we have already started with what is called a kind of a coordinate change. So this is actually what is called is the rotation. So what is now happening, you see, you see here the object undergoes a rotation in the frames of reference. So again, I will use uh, the red pen just to show you that this has turned and it has got into X prime. So undergone a rotation. It has already undergone a rotation. So you see that uh, effectively, it has the effect of, of rotating the spatial, uh, I would say, spatial axis of the object. And most importantly, the time and the spatial axis of the object's frame remains orthogonal. That means the time and the spatial coordinates do not mix altogether. So you see the time is orthogonal. It remains here. That means it is not mixing with this coordinate, the x. It is quite orthogonal. Yet it has undergone a change because we can see evidently that there is an angle which is being formed. Obviously, that essentially means that it is a change. So we can say that the boosts are what we are specifically interested in special relativity. I was telling that these boosts actually means from one a reference frame moving to another reference frame. And most importantly, we should tell in this way, uh, let me put it in a quick text over here so that it is easy for you to understand. So sorry. Uh, these boosts, yeah. So these boosts from one frame of another, another are called Lorentz transformations. 
So basically, we are watching what is called a Lorentz transformation. As we have seen over here, the stationary and the moving, and from here also, it has boosted up to X prime direction. And here also, we have seen a boost. So this is actually a boost. But remember here, the striking feature, we will explain here. Yeah, the spatial and the temporal axis are orthogonal. That means they are not mixing or getting mixed with each other. So I, I hope this is fine. Now, uh, this is a, not a Lorentz boost, right? So I mean to say Lorentz boost, I would say it would be a little bit difficult uh, to uh, visualize. But anyway, boosts are basically what we call transformation between reference frames that are moving with a constant velocity. Remember, we actually started this by telling this part that all observers should agree on the speed of light, sorry, and they are covariant Lorentz transformation. That means they are actually moving with a constant velocity because we are taking what is called the inertial frames of reference. That is, that is, that is, that is very important. Now, so what we are trying to say is that uh, the basic key to understand uh, Maxwell's equations are we are going one by one. So to if we, if we want to transfer relativistically, okay, to transfer from one frame of reference to other. So say, for example, one frame of reference is moving at five, five meters per second, say, for example, in some direction to the frame of reference, uh, to the frame, and another observer is, is moving at 14 maybe uh, uh, minutes per second in some other direction, this would require a Lorentz boost. Because if it I take relativistically, that means transform the transform from the frame of an observer moving at five minutes per second to in a direction of 14 minutes per second would require what is called a Lorentz boost. So I mean to say you can boost basically in any direction. Generally, Lorentz transformation will consist of some kind of a rotation. So in order to make pretty, things pretty simple, we will imagine this as in the x direction. Okay, so what happens is that if an observer is red, yes, for example, I am the observer and there is another observer they are moving at. So if one observer is at rest, then a boosted uh, observer, that means which is traveling, which has got a boost observer frame of reference is moving in the x direction. We will take it with a relative, relative velocity of v. Okay, so here let me show you again uh, the jam board. I'm so sorry. So here it comes, as here you can see uh, that this has uh, changed, right? So one thing which is very important is that uh, in special relativity, I mean to say in Lorentz boost we should talk about, is that it mixes the time and space coordinates of the two observers. That means it actually tells the Lorentz transformation actually acts on space time itself. I mean to say it actually takes together both time and space and it takes and forms a nice beautiful lump which called which is called space time itself and which is called a space time continua now here you can see uh, in this particular uh, uh, you know let me let me make it a little bit bigger for you so here you can see what is happening over here is that this particular x it has moved to x prime this t has moved to t prime, but this t prime is not equal to the original t, obviously, because it has casted a kind of a boost. So what we find is that in this, uh, this is actually a striking feature of Lorentz boost. I mean to say it would actually mix time and space of the coordinates of the two observer and Lorentz boost actually is a, a, um, acting not on space and time separately like Newtonian mechanics, but on the space time itself. So this property, okay, let me put it again in the text that Lorentz transformations actually act on space-time itself. So it will become much clearer. Here it is. I think this is much more visible. So this line is very, very important that it acts on space-time itself. It means it mixes things together. So this property of Lorentz boost is actually what I mean to say 
this mixing of time and space itself actually ca causes all those relativistic effects like length contraction, time dilation, etc. We will uh, later note into it. Now, this actually rotations is also what is called, let me put forward to uh, in the text also, I was talking about this, very important. It is called Poincare transformations. Just a second. Should we? Yeah. So this is actually what is called a Poincare transformations. I mean to say this group of transformations or rotations or tilting of the axis, whatever is called the Poincare transformation. But for the time being, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to ignore Poincare uh, transformation and I'm only going to take ahead with Lorentz transformation. So uh, actually what happens in case of a Lorentz transformation is that we can say, okay, say for example, I have got an equation. Say for example, it can be anything. I will just suppose this is an equation. Let us suppose. Any equation, say I would write. So what I would like to suggest is that this would be considered as a, we say that, uh, you know, any equation is relativistic. When we can say, when we say that the equation is relativistic, it ha this means that the equation has the same form in all frames of reference. Okay, let me put it also here for you has, okay, I'm so sorry, it should be a little bit bigger, has the same form in all frames of reference, then only what we can say it is a relativistic equation. So that's, that is basically the form, relativistic equation. So we can call, when we can call an equation as a relativistic equation, this is the criteria. We can call it only as a relativistic equation, provided that this has the same form in all frames of reference. This equation will be a relativistic equation only, which has got the same form in all frames of reference. So from here, what we can deduce this fact that an equation being relativistic means that it prefer, preserves its form. So an equation being relativistic means it preserves its form. I will also put it over here so that you can really remember. So an equation being relativistic means that it preserves its form. It preserves its form. Now, what do we mean by form? That we mean by when we transform it, just I mean to say when we saw that we really boosted it, in x direction or in this direction, whatever, from one frame of reference to another uh, through a Lorentz transformation. And Lorentz transformation, therefore, determine whether something is compatible with special relativity or not. OK, let me repeat it once more. When we say an equation is relativistic, we mean that it this equation has the same form in all frames of reference. An equation is, uh, being relativistic means that it preserves its form, number one. When we transform it from one frame of reference to another frame of reference through Lorentz transformation and Lorentz transformation therefore determine whether that something is at all capable or compatible with special relativity or not. That means what we can understand from here that Lorentz transformation is a kind of a criteria. It is a kind of a criteria which will determine that if it is uh, compatible with special relativity, how it will determine the Lorentz transformation will determine. So it is basically the Lorentz transformation is a determining factor whether something is compatible with special relativity. If the doctor says that you are fine, then you are fine. If the doctor says not, that means you're not fine. So it is a kind of an acting as a doctor will tell that whether it is compatible with special relativity or not. Now, what is the very special thing about Lorentz transformation is that they preserve the speed of light. I will also try to put it this in the form of a text so that it becomes very clear to you. Yes, this is it. The special thing about Lorentz transformation is that this preserve the speed of light. Now, you can see here that how this actually, this text, I mean to say how they actually follow from one part of the other. Uh, what we find uh, right now from here that because Lorentz transformation 
is something that they preserve the speed of light. This is why, according to special relativity, the speed of light is same from all observers. The speed of light is same for all observers. Now, what we, the other important thing is that it turns out that Maxwell's equations also preserve their form under Lorentz transformation. So it is something, you know, like A equals to B and B equals to C. Absolutely. Because first what we found is that an equation is relativistic only when it is same in all forms. Lorentz transformations actually determines whether something is compatible uh, with special relativity or not. And the special thing about Lorentz transformation is what? That they preserve the speed of light. Hence, we can say that Maxwell's equations also preserve their form under Lorentz transformation. That means Maxwell's equation are Lorentz covariant technically, but we can say that they go uh, as per with the speed of light because Lorentz transformation itself is telling that, yes, come on, Maxwell, you are going and preserving the speed of light and their form, and hence you are truly relativistic. And here you see uh, in this uh, part, I would like to show you, okay, these things are already done. So we have already learned this. These equations are relativistic. Why, when do we say that is Lorentz covariant? So here you can see what I'm trying to tell is that uh, all those, uh, you know, Maxwell's equation, which is happening in one frame of reference, which is very static. Okay, when we put it, you see now x is boosted up to x prime, t is boosted up to t prime. This is the fundamental reason the Maxwell equations have the same form. That means nothing actually changes. 1, 2, 3, 4 remains 1, 2, 3, 4 in spite of the boost. And this boost can be either in the x direction or the rotation or anything else. So now we understood that this is the fundamental reason why we say that Maxwell's equation are relativistic or compatible with special relativity because they remain the same for all relativistic observer. But hold on. Yes, I think you are wondering that how we can show it mathematically. We will come to that part slowly, slowly. But first, the understanding of the basic overall concept is important. So we need to understand first what is called a Lorentz covariance property because to define Lorentz transformation as transformation that preserves Maxwell's equation. And that is the real reason why special relativity and Lorentz transformation, I would say, are equally, I would say, compatible. That means it goes along with special theory of relativity. So that's all for today's uh, class, today's lecture. So I just wanted to give you first a kind of a basic idea about Lorentz invariance. We saw first this part of the equation, which I would like to show you just for a second, just to quickly recap those ideas. First, we saw what is a stationary and what is a moving object and how do we do the transformation. Then what we saw, this is a kind of a transformation where the X is boosted in this direction, what is called an observer. And remember that we are only talking with inertial frames of reference. So it has got what is called a constant velocity. Now, these are called Poincaré transfer transformation, but we are taking uh, account into Lorentz transformation. And most important is that Lorentz transformation, we see that the spatial and the temporal coordinates are orthogonal. That means Lorentz transformation actually is occurring on space time itself. And you see another thing which we will see again uh, in tomorrow's class, that is Galilean transformation, the T that the temporal axis here, it has changed, but in that case, it remains constant. I will show you uh, just a second. Let me see if I've got that. Yeah. Time uh, in that case, we will see in the next class is that time is universal quantity. So the difference, basic difference between Galilean boost, I would say, or Lorentz boost is that Galilean boost does not uh, consider or change the time coordinate or observer. It is taken as, I would say, as a universal quantity. And that creates a lot of problem. We will look into that tomorrow. And second part is what is called a constant velocity. This was the first slide, obeys Newton's law. And these boosts from one frame to another, they follow what is called a Lorentz transformation. And here we saw that an equation is a relativistic equation when it has the same form in all forms of reference. So an equation being relativistic means that the equation preserves its form. What decides? Lorentz transformation decides. And what does Lorentz transformation do? The special thing about Lorentz transformation is that they preserve what is called the speed of light. And most importantly, what we found, the conclusion is that the Lorentz, uh, I mean to say, 
it preserves the form and Lorentz transformation therefore determine whether something is compatible. I mean to say compatible special relativity or not. The special thing about Lorentz transformation is that they preserve what is the speed of light. And that is why according to special relativity, the speed of light is the same for all observers. And we also saw that Maxwell's equation also uh, preserve the form of Lorentz transformation. Hence, we can say that Maxwell's equations are relativistic in nature. I mean to say they are fully relativistic. Further, what we saw around here is that the frames of reference, which is happening in a static frame of reference, if we boost that using the Lorentz transformation, whatever the boost, we will see that the Maxwell's equations are exactly the same. So that's it for today's uh, lecture. We have already initiated the intuitive understanding of uh, these are important for the reason that we need to go ahead and understand the relativistic Maxwell's equation, the invariance form, a little bit of electromagnetic tensor, Faraday tensor, etc. Then we can take it forward into the geometric transformation from relativity to general theory of relativity. Thank you very much for watching this lecture. Please do let me know how do you like it. And do not forget to subscribe to my channel, General Relativity Explained, which is very exclusive to explaining only and only Einstein General Theory of Relativity. See you tomorrow at 8.15 p.m., same channel, with further uh, elucidations and understanding on relativistic maximal equations. Thank you very much.